So in today's lesson, we're going to talk about internal components of our computer, what's inside the case. And typically, there are several components inside of the computer case, the motherboard, CPU, the cooling system, the ROM, the RAM, adapter cards, storage drives, and our internal cables. And we're going to begin by talking about our motherboard. So our motherboard is the main printed circuit and it contains our buses and other components like the CPU, the RAM, our expansion slots and our wires that connect everything. Now when we traditionally think of motherboards we also have to consider our form factor and just like our cases and our power supplies have different form factors so do our motherboards and our form factors need to all be the same if we are assembling a computer from scratch or we're doing any upgrades to our computer and if you look at this sheet here down below you'll see some of the form factors that are used today. The ATX is one of the most popular form factors and often in the PC, mainstream PCs, this will be the one used. So for example if you have an ATX case then you're going to have an ATX power supply, motherboard and other devices that are going to match that. Next we have our central processing unit and our CPU is the main processor doing all of the computing for our computer. And the CPU executes a program, and a program is a sequence of stored instructions. Now, there are two major types of CPU architecture that relates to these instruction sets. We have reduced instruction set computer, or RISC, and we have complex instruction set computer or CISC. Now our CPUs are measured in megahertz or gigahertz and it is the speed or cycles per second that our computer CPU works at. And a couple other terms that you want to be familiar with is hyperthreading and hypertransport and these two things um, are incorporated into our CPU and can enhance the performance of the CPU. In most cases we want our computers to work faster and do more things so we have to sometimes exceed the limitations of what our processor can do. So the amount of processes that our CPU can do at one time is controlled by the size of the processor data bus. Now some manufacturers get around this by using a technique called overclocking and this allows the processor to work faster than was originally specified. Now we have different types of central processors we have dual core, triple core, quad core, hexacore, and octacore, and this is the amount of cores within a processor. So this allows our processor to do more things and to do multitasking and do things to allow us to be more productive. One thing to note about a triple core processor is that it is really a four core processor with one of the cores turned off. Another important component of our computer are our cooling system fans. So because our processor and all the components inside of the computer generate a lot of heat and that heat can damage the computer we need to be able to remove this heat from the case. So the design of the case and cooling fans and fins 
or vents inside of our computer case will help us do that. Traditionally, there are three types of fans. There's a case fan, a heat sink fan, and a graphics processing fan. So a case fan is one that is designed to pull air through the case and or out of the case. A heat sink fan is usually one that sits on top of the heat sink and the heat sink is on top of the CPU and the heat sink draws heat off of the CPU. It looks like a little radiator in some cases and there are grids on it and that will pull it up and then the fan also pulls it away. Sometimes there will be vent channels that will be on top of these fans so the air can get directly outside of the computer. If a computer has a larger graphic processor then they sometimes will require fans too to remove the heat. The next big component that we need for our computer to work is our ROM and our RAM. Our ROM is our read-only memory and this is where our computer finds its basic instructions so it can start up and load the operating system. ROM chips retain their information even when they're powered off. Unlike RAM chips, which is the random access memory, they are only temporary storage. And when you turn the power off, whatever was stored in them temporarily is gone. RAM is volatile memory, which means that the contents are erased when the computer is powered off. So volatile is a very important term to remember. So the more RAM your computer has, the more it usually can store and enhance what it's doing. So when your CPU is working and it's trying to process information, it temporarily stores it in the RAM. It will load the operating system in the RAM and allow the computer to do more things. Now our RAM can be different types of memory molecules. So we have dual inline package RAM, DIP, and these memory molecules are soldered to this, a circuit board. And then these circuit boards were able to easily install and remove for upgrading. We also have single inline memory modules, SIM, dual inline memory modules, which are DIM. We have RAM bus inline memory modules, RIM, and then we have small outline DIM, so DIM, and it's a smaller, more condensed version of a DIM which provides random access data storage that is ideal for use in laptops, printers, and other devices where we need to conserve space. And so there are two things that we offer, three things that we consider about RAM is how much memory it can store, how large that memory chip is or that chip circuit board is, and the third thing is how fast it can work. If you have a fast processor but your RAM can't process that data that's coming to it as fast then you might as well not have a fast processor. So three things to consider. The actual size of the chip how much it can store and how fast it can work. We also have a couple other things on there that deal with our RAM. We have our catch and our error checking. So our catch, we have SRAM, which is used to catch memory to store the most frequently used data. And our SRAM provides the processor with a faster process to the data that retrieving it from the slower DRAM or main memory. So things that the computer is going to use regularly, it will store in the catch. Now, because our computers do make errors, if we have memory chips that can check on those errors, then they can 
also make sure that the data they're processing is correct and uh, our computer will work better. So we have three types of ways to check that data error. We have non-parity, parity, and ECC. So now I want to talk about adapter cards. So adapter cards are a great way for us to expand our computers. So when you buy a computer, you might not know what you want to use it for, or in the future, you might want to add some other type of capability to your computer. So having expansion slots allows us to add cards to upgrade our computer. So they increase the functionality of our computer. So some examples of data cards, we have sound adapter cards and video ones, USB, parallel, and serial part ports, and then we have network cards, and they can be also, they can be wireless ones. There are different types of slots, of these expansion slots. We have PCI, which is Peripheral Component Interconnect, Advanced Graphic Port, the AGP, PCI Express, and Mini PCI, and those are used in laptops. The Advanced Graphic Port was very common in computers for upgrading the graphics card. Today, a lot of graphics cards are using the PCI Express slot, uh, mainly the 16 one. Next thing I want to talk about is our storage drives. And so we have our ROM and our RAM. Our ROM is where our computer can pull up data so it can load the operating system. And it loads it into the RAM, but it has to get the operating system from somewhere, and that's from our storage devices. The main one that we think of is our hard disk drive, or our HDD, and it is a magnetic storage device, and the larger they are, the more expensive they can be. Usually we measure those in gigabytes or terabytes, so GBs or TBs. Our magnetic hard drives have motors in them, and they spin these platters, and they store our information in sectors. Another type of drive that's becoming very popular today is our solid state drives or our SSDs. And they don't have any moving parts and so they can work faster and they're a little bit more reliable and they use less power. They used to be expensive but they're coming down in price. Um, they're starting to be used in laptops today. So uh, a really nice new technology. Even though we don't use these a lot today, the floppy disk drive or the FDD, you want to be familiar with these. You might work on some older computers that would have a disk drive, a floppy disk drive in it, and they easily used a 3.5 inch floppy disk, and it could store up to 1.44 megabytes of data. Not very large. Today we have some other drives that are used in our computers to store information. We have optical drives, flash drives. Our optical drives, we usually think of DVD and Blu-rays and CD. And they are a lot larger than the floppy drives. And it, when they first came out, optical drives, you can only read from them, but today you can read and write. The flash drive is a removable storage device that connects to a USB port. And they are usually smaller. They don't require a lot of power or no power. And uh, they re require no power to retain the data. So flash drives um, are a great way to transport documents today. So we have some common drive interfaces that we should think about. We have IDE, which is the Integrated Drive Electronics, Enhanced Integrated Drive Electronics, EIDE. Our 
parallel atta, which is pata, our serial atta, which is sata, and external sata, eSATA, and then we have small computer system interface or SCSI. When we talk about computers, we need to think about RAID and our storage. RAID provides a way to store data across multiple hard disks for redundancy. Redundancy is when we are repeating or backing up our information. So you want to, in your reading, you're going to have this sheet. You want to make sure you understand RAID. It's very important. And the last thing we're going to talk about is our cables today. And we have internal cables that are inside of our computer connecting all of the devices inside of there. We have cables that supply power and we also have cables that supply data. And some of the power cables that you want to be familiar with is the SATA, Molex, and Berg. We also have some front panel cables that connect case buttons and lights to the motherboard. And then we have our data cables that connect the drives to the drive controller. So we have cables for the floppy drive, so our FDD data cable. We have our PADA, our IDE data cable, and that's 40 conductors on it. And then we have our PADA, which is our EIDE data cable, which is 80. And we have our SATA data cable and our SCSI data cable. You want to make sure that you look through and understand all the different types of cables and how they connect. Most of our cables are keyed, and that means that they can only go on a certain way. Again, there is a um, sheet that's going to refer, and you want to make sure you do all the reading for this. Okay, so today that will be the end of our lesson. The next time we're going to pick up with our external ports and cables. Again, remember this is just a supplement and I'm pointing out the main focus points for the lesson. You really want to make sure that you do do the reading and you watch any supplement videos that might be within the case. Also do all labs and answer questions that will help you prepare, prepare for the exam. Alright, thanks. Have a great day.